Good morning, people. Good to see you guys here again today. I want to talk about um, creation today. How many, how many enjoy being outside, taking a, taking a walk or, or just being outside uh, to see what God has made for us? And uh, Yeah, I, I'm one of those people, too. And um, there, there's so much out there all right, uh, that when you stop to look at it, it, it it's just amazing. Ab to me, it's just absolutely amazing. If you look at the, if you're out there at nighttime and uh, it's a clear night and you look up and you see all them points of light, which are, they're stars, of course. That, uh, I mean, there, there's an untold number of, of those out there and stuff. And you just, you just have to stop and think, wow, this is so beautiful. And uh, it, it, what the Lord has made here. And, uh, and un un unfortunately, it seems like some people and uh, uh, teach, uh, think this is all evolution. Uh, unfortunately, they still uh, found out, teach that in the schools today. All right. Uh, all wrong. All wrong. Uh, I think so. But that's, that's sort of what I want to talk about a little bit here today. Um, creation. I want to give you some examples, okay, of, of some of the things that we can see out there that um, if that ever comes up in conversation, maybe you can use some of these examples uh, to point to uh, out that, uh, that there's, there's got to be some kind of intelligent design behind what's out there, okay? All right. Now, so in, in spite of being messed up by sin, and, and all right, uh, we're stuck on this planet with uh, the sin, unfortunately, right now, Nature still right, has a beautiful testimony to the love and the power uh, of our divine creator. After being under the, the heavy curse of sin for, what, almost 6,000 years, roughly speaking, you can still see so much beauty out there, okay, and, and of God's handiwork, all right? When we thank God for our blessings, we should never forget to mention the natural wonders that add so much meaning to our lives. Think about it in a minute. Now, what would this planet be like without that carpet of green grass and foliage out there? Right? Uh, you, you stop to think about that a minute, okay? Um, you have all this greenery out there, uh, all the trees and grass and other shrubbery and what have you, all right? And isn't it interesting when you stop thinking about it? All right, so what do we do? We breathe in oxygen, right? And what do we exhale? Carbon dioxide, okay? Now, isn't it interesting you think about it? What do the, all that shrubbery and trees, what do they take in? Carbon dioxide. And they give off what? Oxygen that we need. What an interesting uh, cycle there, okay? Okay. Right? Uh, you, you look around and all that stuff, and, and, and you, uh, uh, you see bright colors, okay, from, uh, uh, from time to time, especially um, if you look at some of uh, the shrubbery and uh, you look at some of the birds, for example. Oh, wow, the color's there. And now, we could, we could have survived, all right, on, on a planet that was, you know, gray and uh, kind of stuff. We, did, we wouldn't have need, uh, needed that color. But our Lord Creator put that color there for us to enjoy. All right? Um, the Creator himself was not only a lover of beauty, I think, but he loved us so much that he wanted us to be happy also. So that's why he covered the earth with about a half million varieties of, of contrasting blossoms and leaves. And hidden each inside each but tiny little bud, God placed secrets in there that would challenge the minds of Earth's greatest uh, scientists. Now, how strange it is that so many of those who wrestle with these mysteries do not recognize the creative power that produces them. Uh, I remember um, years ago, I, I remember uh, hearing this story, Just uh, I think I've commented on this before in Sabbath school, but when NASA uh, was charged... Um, with getting a man to the moon, all right, kind of stuff. One of the things, of course, they had to do was map out all the planets and the moons and, and their orbits and the, and the sun and all that kind of stuff, okay? And so they did, and they put that in a computer, 
and mapped that thing out. And they found out, after they did all this kind of stuff, everything was off by, by a day or so. And they couldn't figure out, why is it, why, what's going on with this computer simulation? Why, why is, you know, why is the, the, the earth a day behind? And why is, everything was a day or so behind. And they searched and they searched. They never could figure out themselves what the problem was. And one, finally, one NASA guy said, well, you know, in the Bible it says, guess what? All right, the Lord stopped things for what? About a day or so, right? Remember when Moses held up his hands, right? That was the only suggestion that, that from what I uh, recall of the story that they could come up with to explain what that computer model was a day or so behind. All right? Even though many scientists stand in awe uh, of, a, of the living creature. Few seem to recognize and honor our creator. Breathing the marvelous blend of nitrogen and oxygen that makes it possible for them to live, evolutionists refuse to acknowledge that that 79% nitrogen and 21% oxygen was provided by something other than blind chance. Mm -hmm. Looking through the uh, eyes so delicately arranged that no combination of scientific genius can even understand, much less duplicate. And unbelievers deny the miracle when it makes it impossible to see through their eyes. All right. Now they can duplicate it, because right, with the cameras and all that kind of stuff, but they, can, they can't uh, make it exactly like our eyes. Um, through ears, which connect to a brain more complex than the largest computer on Earth. All right. These doubters listen to lectures on humanism and evolution. Who are these people who scorn God so much and, and his creative power? They're, they're a small part of humanity whose very existence, breath by breath, depends upon the operation of the laws over which they have no control. Rejecting the divine origin of that for which they find no empirical evidence, many scientists ascribe the miraculous qualities to manner itself. They build up theories in which they place absolute faith, even to the point of believing that blind, unintelligent nature created life out of non-life. And of course, Charles Darwin, uh, as we know, is one example of this. Right? Now, so what kind of faith is required to believe that all the orderly processes of nature were produced by chance? Almost every plant and animal exhibits amazing adaptations that can only be described as miraculous. If these highly complex functions had no intelligent creator or designer, then our reasoning powers are staggered by the millions of coincidences that operate with infinite precision to produce the beauty that w and function and reproduction on the earth. I, I, I'm not. I'm not a medical doctor. I don't have any kind of medical degree whatsoever. A, a very basic uh, kind of stuff. Uh, doctors and of course others. Uh, Doug, for example, also uh, they have a much better knowledge I have of, of what goes on in the human body. But you stop to think about it just for a few minutes of all the complex chemical reactions. Okay, of all the various cells that's within our body. And, and how in the world can you think that we evolved out, out of some protoplasmic pool uh, some millions or thousands of years ago? I, I, it's just no way. Just no way. You know, the evidence in favor of creationism is, is there's so much of that in nature itself. The Bible suggests that the animals and earth should be asked about their own origin. So now let me see if I can get to the some verses here that I want to talk about this morning. Okay, Job chapter 12, verse 7. I'm going to start here. It says, But ask now the beasts, and they shall teach thee, and the fowls of the air, and they shall tell thee. And if we go and look at verse 8, Or speak to the earth, and it shall teach thee, and the fishes of the sea shall declare unto thee. And verse 9, who knoweth not in all these that the hand of the Lord hath wrought this? Okay. Now Job says, if you want to know how God operated in the work of creation, so you just ask the various forms of life. Ask the earth. And the earth will explain how God has wrought 
in these various things. So that's kind of what I'm going to take a look at here right now. So what does the earth have to say to us concerning the great power of God? Did you know that, there are, that there's, there's miracles all around us, people, all right? From the towering mountains to the, the, the vast, restless ocean and throughout the universe, there is the throb and hum of life. From the microscopic to the immense, we can discover the fingerprints of our mighty creator who brought all things into existence. So, and I'm going to get into some examples here of some of this here, okay? Now, when I happen to look at the universe and see the amazing fact that it is in perfect balance, that life in this world has been perfectly adapted to the conditions that we find here, there has to be some great intelligence behind it, making the things operate in such a good manner. All right? The Genesis account of the Bible has been completely vindicated by all the findings of true science. The writings of Moses have been found to be scientifically as well as historically accurate. Today, I want to take a look at the water and land. All right? And by studying the mysteries of the land and the sea, we can see how wonderfully they support the biblical story of creation. So I'm going to go back to Genesis here and take a look at the story as God gave it to us. Now, Hopefully I got this. Okay, Genesis chapter 1, verse 6. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Now if we look at verse 7. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And in verse 8, And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. So now long, long ago, the waters that were over the earth were actually right down here upon the surface. We know that there's a vast ocean of water suspended in the atmosphere, okay? But no water vapor, okay? We'll find out here in just a minute what purpose it serves, but at one time that water was resting right here upon the earth. God divided it and lifted a part of it up into the sky while part of it remained on the surface. Now, if we go ahead and uh, continue here and look at verse 9, okay? And it says, And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And if we look at verse 10, And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called these seas. Notice plural there, seas. And God saw that it was good. So now how did Moses know that there would be several oceans or seas? He had absolutely no human way right, of knowing that there could be more than one body of water in the entire world. He never went around to see how many oceans were in the world, but God inspired this truth in Moses' mind. He said there were seas or oceans. So now here's another question. Think about this, okay? How did Moses know that all of these various bodies of water would be connected and would rest in only one bed? Now, isn't that what he said, though? Let all the waters be gathered into one place and let the dry land appear. Now, in that ne next verse, he said that there were seas or oceans. It is a scientific and geographical fact that all the oceans of the world are joined together and they do all rest in one common bed. Moses could not have known that of himself. He didn't say this of dry land. No, he said it was divided up into continents. Part of it would be over here, and another big part uh, of it would be over there in another location. Now, but concerning the waters, he said it would all be in one place, and yet it would be divided into oceans. Now, now I think that's a wonderful thing that the Bible is so scientifically accurate as to reveal these things. Now, let's see how intelligence and design came into the ratio of land and water, all right? Most of you know that one, roughly one-fourth of the Earth's surface is dry land, right? And the other three-fourths is water, roughly speaking. In the United States alone, we have three and three-quarter million square miles of dry land. And somehow, all of that land has to get watered, all right? Uh, kind of stuff. Now, in fact, if it wasn't watered, there would be no vegetation and no growing grass or trees. Now, uh, remember, uh, yes, yeah, some we got some deserts in places. Don't get me wrong, but even deserts get some rain every once in a while. Right? I think so. 
Now just imagine for a moment that the ratio of land and water was changed from what it is at present. The proportion of water and land determines the rainfall on the earth. Suppose the ocean was only half of its present size. That would mean our rainfall would only be a quarter of what we get now. So, now, so what would that mean for the three and three-quarter million square miles of land that we have here in the U.S.? Right? All of it would be turned into a vast, dry desert. But on the other hand, if half the present land were added to the ocean, then there would be four times as much rainfall as there is now, and the entire United States would be turned into a vast marshland. Now, all right, so, so let's just suppose that mankind had to water this entire three and three-quarter million square miles of land. All right, so, so let's, let's, all right, let's just suppose you had the job to figure out how to water the United States. All right? So how can you, how can you spread that much water over and, uh, the land and irrigate it effectively? All right, then uh, that, that's, that would be a huge task. That's, uh, uh, that's a lot of land to get watered. So, but, yeah, you think, okay, there's plenty of water in the ocean. All right, yeah, I agree. There's plenty of water in the ocean. And so they could just uh, simply use that to water the land. But now that sounds like a reasonable suggestion. But um, how are you going to get all that water that's in the ocean? And how are you going to distribute that over three and three-quarter million acres in the United States? Right, you you got to figure out how to do that, all right? That stuff and spread it evenly. And, and while I'm uh, talking about that, all right, there's a mineral that's in the water, what, salt in the ocean, right? All right, so how you going to get rid of that salt? You got this job to do. How are you going to get rid of that salt, all right? That would, you know, salt, salt's going to kill the green plants. Now, the third problem is, all right, wait, all right, um, a gallon of water is roughly, I think if I recall correctly, about eight pounds, okay? So water is about 800 times the weight of the atmosphere, all right? Uh, so you've uh, you got a tremendous challenge here to move that much weight around, okay? So how, how has God solved that? How did he solve that problem? All right, he uses heat. We know heat expands things and cold contracts them, so that, and that, that the water is the material... Uh, subject to expansion. In fact, when turned into steam, it becomes 1,600 to 1,700 times its original volume. Okay, remember, though, this liquid water is 800 times heavier than the atmosphere, though. So God simply sends down the warming rays of the sun, turns the water into a vapor that's 900 times lighter than the water. Now it's one-eighth the times lighter than the atmosphere. So this vapor then is easily lifted up, carried into the sky, perhaps, uh, perhaps miles up there, and formed into a great masses of uh, water vapor and clouds. So now uh, the second problem regarding the salt, God simply just evaporates the water and leaves the mineral deposits behind. Now taken up into the clouds, the water is sweet and soft, perfectly adapted to irrigate the earth. Okay, but now how are you going to transport that? Now you got it up there, but how are you going to transport it? So you got all this water vapor up above the oceans, okay? How are you going to do that? The water uh, lifted up. It's still hanging there. Uh, it doesn't need any more water there. But so that then uh, due to the rotation of the earth, guess what's happened? you got winds, all right? It, uh, you, you, you stop and you think about this, you know, all the amazing inter interdependencies of what goes on, all right? So you got the rotation of the earth, you got these winds. Now the winds blow these clouds over the land. All right? That stuff. So now you get it over the land, but now you got to get it out of the clouds. So you got all this stuff over the land. Well, it's water vapor, but now you got to get it out. So how are you going to do that? All right? Remember, cold will, of course, contract. So when the clouds pass over the mountain peaks, the cold air uh, reaches up and begins to cool these clouds, and it turns the water vapor back into um, rain. Now consider what would happen if the clouds ha gave up all of that water at one time. All right. If you did that at one time, of course it's going to flood the entire surface of the earth with a, uh, roughly about um, this estimated some, some feet of water. Therefore, the cooling process has to be gradual. For example, if the temperature of the cloud is uh, lowered by 9 degrees, it will drop about half its water. So God arranges for a gradual cooling to let the rain come down and, and then gentle to vigorous showers to provide the amounts needed on the earth. So that, 
And so, again, what a beautiful process he's done here, okay? Some of it, um, well, uh, that rain uh, goes back into the ocean, of course, and, and then it, it's needed there to provide the necessary amount of oxygen for the, the fish that's living in the ocean beds. So you, uh, you have all these great facts of nature that were known and understood long before the scientists discovered them. If we look at Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 7, now here we go. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. And unto the place from whence the rivers come, there they return again. The Bible says that the reason the seas don't overflow is that the water is taken up again and returned to where the rivers came from. So you got this wonderful cycle, right? This wonderful cycle. So there's a constant movement of that water going up from the ocean in vapor form, carried as clouds over the land, brought down again as rain, which forms rivulets to the, find their way back to the sea. So even the great scientists felt they had made a new discovery when they found out about the cycles of clouds. They thought they could have seen that all along if they had just read the scriptures. So now another text of scientific information, if we look at this, is Job 26, verse 8. Hopefully I got that here. He said, he bindeth up the waters in his uh, thick clouds, and the cloud is not sent under them. Uh, it's not rent under them, I'm sorry. This is a beautiful text explaining that the clouds don't break up and spill all their water at once, even though millions of tons of water are drawn up from the ocean into the clouds. And, of course, Job was correct. We just found that God has a process of gradual cooling that releases the water little by little, as is needed to irrigate the surface of the earth. God revealed it to Job long before mankind figured it out. Now, I'm sure all of you know that water's got weight, like we talked about, and that its pressure increases dramatically as the depth increases. Now, certain fish that exist in the very bottom of the ocean are especially engineered by God to withstand the tremendous pressure. If you brought that uh, particular fish up to the surface pretty quickly, um, they would basically they're going to explode. Uh, the pressure that God put into their muscular structure is still there on the inside when they are brought up when the, where the pressure is not exerted from the outside. Okay, so this is a wonderful little fact. Okay, but do you realize that we too um, we live people in the uh, bottom of an atmospheric sea, right? At the bottom of air. There's air that we uh, walk around in here, people, and breathe. Okay, and it does, it does have weight, okay? Air does have weight. At sea level, we're living down at the bottom of this thing, uh, roughly 14 pounds, I think it is. Every moment that we live, a pressure of 14 pounds per square inch is exerted upon our body structure, and that's, eh, that's somewhat heavy. We think a man is strong if he can carry 200 pounds on his back. In fact, the strongest man that ever lived put 415 pounds over his head, Yet every single form of life in this world, whether it's a 90-pound woman or a strong man, have a constant total pressure uh, of over 15 tons at sea level pressing against him uh, from every direction. All right? 15, that's 30,000 pounds, people. But we were created to live in that. We can function in that, okay? Now, even the filmy, gauzy insects have been designed by God to withstand their proportions of this pressure. That little gnat, so light and frail that it seems anything could crush it, is built by God to withstand the weight of the atmosphere. Now, um, and, and people, this, this, this could not have happened by chance. This just could not. If we look at Job 28, verse 25, to make the weight for the winds and the weight of the waters by measure. All right? The Bible says even the winds got weight. The air, in other words, is heavy. The atmosphere has weight, and if you climb a mountain now, the higher you climb, the thinner the atmosphere becomes, and you get distressed and you feel uncomfortable. Why? Because the pressure is not as great up there. You see, God has built a certain amount of pressure that balances that on the outside at sea level. If you won't go high enough, you would be just as stressed out as that fish brought up from the ocean depth. How wonderful God is, right? That he designed each living creature to exist in the atmosphere that God put them in. Now consider another even greater miracle, right? The atmosphere around us is made up of two ingredients, right? What is it, nitrogen and what's the other? Oxygen, yeah. 
Well, he's a mixture like I talked about. Uh, one's 79% and the other's about 21%. Okay, well, I don't care where you go, that's, that's what you get. It's 70, basically 79% nitrogen and 21% oxygen. Now, then, then there are some other gases in there, helium and a couple of other things, but that's a very uh, minor percentage. So now, you, why is that? How come it's that way, all right? Is there some particular reason for it? Is it important that we have that exact mixture of nitrogen and oxygen? I think so. If um, you get to looking at it, let's say you increase the nitrogen, okay, uh, percentage. Now, my life processes are going to slow down. Uh, if you increase it too much, we're going to die. If the oxygen were measurably increased, our life processes would be rapidly increased. Our pulse rate would uh, run away, and soon we would wear out and die. But God made it just right. Well, uh, suppose, for example, that um, it was 66.7% nitrogen and 33.3% oxygen. Now, if that proportion prevailed, an electrical reaction would cause the elements to combine. And the whole world, now, do you know what that uh, ends up being? You ever been to the dentist's office? Okay. Do you know uh, some of the stuff they use? Uh, it's a gas that they use to help uh, reduce uh, the pain, right? Kind of stuff. Well, it's laughing gas, they call it. All right. Well, that's kind of per that's pretty much what that proportion is. It's laughing gas. So everybody be going out and laughing all the time. Yeah. All right. You got it. All right. They be laughing because um, that's in, uh, yeah, N2O. Now, the same kind of dentist uh, use I uh, want to talk about extracting teeth. Now, suppose it was divided half and half, 50% and 50%. All right. Now, what, what, you know what that chemical is? Anybody know? Roughly 50% nitrogen, 50% oxygen. It's an acid, all right? Nitric oxide, okay? Can't, can't live in that, people. Um, what, what was a lucky accident that uh, came out and they did? All right? Was that something like that? Did some blind happenstance of nature provide that exact mixture that is necessary for life support? Or was there some intelligence design behind it? The world will become chaotic if this atmospheric mixture slipped out of control for just even a second. We would see one of the most tremendous of explosions because nitrogen is a basic component of gunpowder and oxygen, of course, makes for rapid combustion. It would be a quick goodbye world. And yet someday, apparently, that's going to be an explosion like this. Um, some, someday the elements are going to melt with fervent heat. If we look at uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10 here, all right? That the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Now, I don't know how God will arrange that, but I do know that some great fire in one of these days is going to burn, and the earth will be purified by that strange fire from God. And the elements will be involved in it because the elements are going to melt. Now, maybe God's going to change, I don't know, very, very, very slightly the, uh, the present proportion of nitrogen and oxygen or, or, or cause this great configuration to, to, to take place. I, I have no idea. Somehow it's going to happen. The Bible says it will. Uh, maybe, maybe it'll be due to um, the use of atomic bombs. I don't know. I've got no idea. Okay. Now, another mystery of nature uh, described in the Bible long before it was investigated by science, and we should see this, let me see here, in Job 38, verse 8, okay? Or who shut up the sea with doors when it break forth, as it had uh, issued out of, the, um, out of the womb? And verse 9, when I made the clown the garment thereof, and thick darkness a swaddling band for it, and break up for it my decreed place. Oh, that stuff in him. And uh, set bars and doors and said, Hitherto shalt thou come, but no further, and here shalt thou proud waves be stayed. Yeah, there we go, verse 11. Okay. So this is some nice, beautiful language here uh, to describe the creation of the ocean. It speaks as of being born and coming forth from the womb. God says that the cloud was the garment of it, and thick darkness was a swaddling band placed around the ocean at its birth. But then God added, Here ye may come, but no further. Here shall thy proud waves be stayed. 
The scientists of this world have been amazed in learning the secrets of tidal actions. They still don't quite completely understand all the deep underwater cataclysmic actions that affect the tides and the wave patterns. They're getting better at it, but they don't have everything figured out. No scientist on the face of the earth has figured out uh, all, of, uh, all of the secrets down there just yet. Now, by the way, these tides of movements of water have perfect balance to contribute to mankind's comfort. Um, how many of you have heard of the Gulf Stream? I'm sure several of you have, okay? Uh, this particular um, body of um, water, so to speak, they don't know everything about it, but they do know some things, all right? It comes out of the Gulf of Mexico. It goes along the eastern seaboard and up into the northern sections of the world. It's like a river flowing through the sea. And it can be, um, you can actually see it distinctly if, if you're high enough in an aircraft, right? You can actually see that. Uh, it's about 70 miles wide and about 3,000 feet deep. Now, when it leaves the Gulf of Mexico, the water temperature is roughly 84 degrees, okay? Off the coast of the Carolinas, it's about a warm 80 degrees. It drops a little bit there. The warming influence actually makes the northern coastal regions of America and Europe habitable. Otherwise, they would be become frozen wastelands. Now, what happens is this warm river uh, reaches the uh, entrance of the Arctic region, known as uh, Baffin Bay, where it meets a frigid polar stream that's coming south uh, from the North Pole, so to speak. As a result of the titanic collision of these two giants, the polar stream is forced down under uh, the Gulf Stream, where it continues on its southward course, finally comes up in the West Indies uh, during their hottest season, thus cooling down that terrible tropical heat. The Gulf Stream gets deflected eastward, going up along the British Isles, that makes the uh, Great Britain somewhat habitable, right? It was in God's plan for this to happen, people. I don't think for a moment that that happened by any chance or accident. Without that deflection of the Gulf Stream, some of those northern lands would be uh, locked in eternal winter. God had to be behind that plan. Let's hurry now and take a look at the, at the creatures of nature and see how intelligence and design came into that picture. Now think for a moment of the fish that inhabit the ocean. They are constantly subject to attack from their enemies from above, like the gulls that swoop down to make their meals off of the marine life. All right. So um, it's interesting you find out when you look at this, fish, by the way, have very uh, special eyeballs. All right? Kind of stuff. They can able to look uh, instantly and in, uh, in all the time in every direction. They can see up, they can see down, they can see pretty much to the side all the time, right? That stuff. So uh, a fish can see, by the way, 30% further than in the, uh, any other visual instruments because God designed the eyeball of the fish to take into consideration the refraction of light. All right, have, you, have you ever seen, uh, looked at a glass of water and you had something inside that glass of water that it doesn't look at the uh, the same shape when you take that object, whatever it is, out of the water? That's because the water bends the lights, all right, and magnifies it. Now, all right? So, uh, God then took care of that situation because when he designed the eye of the fish, he took that refraction of that light into account, all right? Uh, so, you know, goggles can uh, never have come uh, to in existence by chance. Yet evolutionists contend that fishes specialized eyeballs, they just, it just happened. No way. Okay. In the waters of Malaysia, okay, there's a fish with a biblical uh, lens, get this now, built right into its eyes. Okay. I'm sorry, with a bifocal lens that's built right in, into its eyes. All right. So this particular fish, all right, by the size of a sardine, uh, which is prized by uh, food for seagulls, right? They can, uh, the seagulls are constantly sw swooping down to eat this little fish, but the little fish has to watch carefully for the approaching danger. So it has good far vision, but since it feeds on the microscopic larvae that abound in the water, it also has um, near, very good near vision as well. And uh, the creator provided a little bit of membrane that comes halfway up its eyes, giving it bifocal vision. 
that little fish can look up and see the seagulls coming in, and it can look down and see the t little bits of food that it, that it needs to feed on. Okay. We think it wonderful that the skilled optometrist can manufacture glasses, preventing us to see near and far. Yet here's a fish that has been around for a, a few thousand years, and God made it that way from the very beginning. It didn't just develop blindly. It had to be created. All right. Intelligent design was behind it. Now let's examine um, two Pacific Coast water birds I want to talk about here in just a minute. I can find no stronger evidence of design in nature than with this, uh, I'm going to call it Uso. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing it correctly. All right, that's what that bird looks like right there. A right. little friendly little thing that lives in, uh, near mountain streams, down out, especially out in the Pacific West, I'm told. It can usually be found where the water is swift flowing and splashy. This little buoyant bird can be floating along, apparently weightless, and then suddenly it can just sink to the bottom like a piece of lead. All right. He walks around down there picking up bits of food on the stream bed, and after taking his fill, he goes over to the bank, shakes himself off, and mysteriously sets himself afloat again like a, uh, it's just like, it's just like a, it's like a submarine. Okay. I said, well, what does that submarine do All right, when it wants to sink? It puts water in its ballast tanks, right? Making the thing heavier, right? That's how a submarine sinks. And what does it want to do when it wants to come back to the surface? It uses compressed air to blow the water out of them ballast tanks, all right? And it rises. Well, guess what this little bird does? Guess what that little bird does? What God created for him, okay? The same thing. The same thing, people. All right? Now, and you want to, uh, an evolutionist wants to tell me that that evolved? Huh? No, don't think so. Ain't gonna, no, ain't gonna buy it. Okay? All right, now, so there's another bird. Let's see if I got, yeah, here we go. A picture of that particular bird found on the Pacific coast. It lives on a diet of large worms that live in holes in the sand. I mean, because the worm is down at the very bottom of the hole, the bird has to go down to get that worm out. So it happens that although its beak is exactly the right length, all right, that, that, that beak there is roughly six, seven a inches or so, all right, uh, to reach down in that um, hole to get that worm. When that's when he gets down in that hole to get the worm kind of stuff, and uh, now he's down in there, he can't open his beak anymore, right? Because of the beak's in the hole, right? So what's that guy, what's that poor bird going to do? Well, isn't it interesting that God made arrangements, there's a tiny little bit of flap at the end of that beak that he can use to grab that worm, right? Got that little special organ there, right, that God gave that bird, right? You know, it's wonderful that God thought of that little bird and made something very special so he could get its food, right? If he so loves the little birds like that and provides things to make their existence comfortable, don't you think he's willing to provide everything that you and I need? Of course he does. He loves us even more. Remember what the Bible says, he even knows when the sparrows fall. Now, some years ago, a scientific magazine published an article by a clever biologist who did not believe in evolution. And evolution goes to pieces, uh, talking about a bee's knee, the author first reviewed the evolutionist teaching that when the need for a certain organ develops in any creature, the organ is uh, reproduced in response to that need. Nature itself, or some blind chance, supposedly comes along and produces the necessary organ to fit the creature for survival. Then he cited the example of bees. When bees crawl into a pollen-filled blossom, their breathing apparatus gets all stopped up with pollen. Right? Now, the bees uh, pretty much breathe through, through the sides of their body okay so when they crawl in something and, and like that the pollen gets along the, their body okay and stops up uh, their noses so to speak all right they can't even breathe while they're in there uh, gathering that pollen now if i can get to this picture here okay here we go now it so happens that every bee has a special brush located on its knees a stiff brush and you can you can see little pieces of it there like a comb so to speak that it uses to clean out its breathing apparatus when it comes out of the flower so that it won't suffocate. 
Now, the biologist noted that if it was true that these insects develop special equipment in response to a need, the very first bee to exist didn't have these brushes on its knees. When it went into the flower, it would have suffocated. So the whole bee family would have never uh, would have become extinct at the right then and there. So no, rather than these brushes developing slowly through the ages in response to a need, they were provided by God to meet the need and save the very first bee that was made. Now, uh, let's take a look at another little uh, creature here, okay? All right, in this particular one, um, uh, this is like a bacterium cell, okay? Got stuff in you can't see that with a naked eye, pretty much. You have to go and uh, use a microscope. All right, and if I go to the next picture here, all right, and you, and you can see here, um, there's a kind of a, th uh, what they call a flagella, which is kind of a, like a threaded, like appendage that the bacteria cell uses to move around. And what's really amazing here, uh, kind of stuff, and if, and if you look closely uh, at the picture on the right there, um, it sort of resembles, uh, get this, it sort of resembles sort of a, a, a natural, uh, I mean, a man-made motor. It's got a little rotor in there. It's got a little stator in there, okay? A universal joint, so to speak, all right? About 30 different parts to that thing, all right? Now, if one of those parts is missing, that bacteria can't move, all right? So, um, let's see if I got the next picture. Yeah, uh, if you look at the lower part, th this is a picture, uh, I think uh, on the lower one there on the left, all right? Uh, it's 10,000 X magnifications, like from an electron microscope. And you can see that, that, that complex complexity there um, that the bacteria uses to move uh, itself around. Uh, now, how in the world can that be evolved by chance? You got 30 some different parts to that thing, all right? Got stuff. And, and the, without that, the bacteria wouldn't be able to move and do its, uh, do its function. Now, isn't it interesting to know that Charles Darwin stated, he stated that if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. He said that himself. So why do they still teach that in the schools? Hey, why? Hey, I... Uh, I'm, I'm gonna, I, my, my simple answer to that, people, is, is because of uh, the religious implications of that. As a result, when some are faced with that intelligent design, that only points to God in the Bible. And they don't want to admit that to themselves. They don't. The conclusion is that God anticipated the needs of his creatures and made them every necessary function. Every, whatever little piece of uh, something that they needed God put there we should be thankful that God can supply all our needs the Bible says that the fool hath said in his heart there is no God only a God of love and power could have made the marvels that we see around us people and if he cares for the tiny animal world he cares for us too he loves us even more than he loves the bird or the bee or the bacteria cell and he wants to save you and me. He wants to take us at, the, at last to a place where nature will be in perfect balance again and where all of the curse of sin is ever going to be gone. Can we doubt the love of God? No. Who makes such infinite provision for everything that he created? God is good, people. God is good. All right? Nothing has been left alone to suffer extinction or deprivation. Only man's bungling interference with a delicate balance of nature has brought uh, the, uh, us the sorrow and tragedy that we see today. If God cares for the needs of the tiniest cell of the smallest plant or animal, don't you think he has enough to care for us? Of course he does. Another fact I learned when I was taking a look at this is the miracle of nature is concerning the lowly cockleburr. You think about that a little bit here. Surely it was one of the most despised of all plants due to its clinging, pricking nature. I, I can't stand them things. Yet, consider the marvel of its reproduction. Every pod of a cockleburr has two seeds inside, all right, to guarantee its survival. 
But during the first year, only one of the seeds will begin to grow. The other seed waits until the second year to start growing in order to perpetuate two seasons of growth. No wonder those things, those things are so hard to get rid of. But if something happens to the first seed so that it does not grow and produce, the second seed begins to grow uh, immediately instead of waiting for the next year. What, what, uh, what an amazing, uh, just, <laughs> you know, what built-in wisdom of God can communicate it to that waiting seed that it should begin to grow when the first seed's destroyed? No evolutionist has been able to harmonize miracles like this when the theories of naturalism and chance. So we can see that God cares, uh, extends to, uh, to even just the lowest order of, of growing things, okay? Are we not more precious to him than cockleburs? Sure we are. If, work, if he works miracles to safeguard a clinging, contrary cockleburr, he will not guide the ways of those for whom he gave his life. May God open our eyes to the wonder and wisdom of his great work of creation. That's right. yeah. People, you just have to go out and look and see, and, and, and you can see it. All right. Um, now, hopefully, here from pa patriarchs and prophets, there should be a, yeah, as you can see there. In the study of, um, of scientific, of the sciences, uh, we are to obtain a knowledge of the Creator. All true science is but an interpretation of the handwriting of God in the material world. Science brings from her research only fresh evidence of the wisdom and the power of God. Rightly understood, all right, the book of nature and the written word helps us to become acquainted with God. All right. And I think there's one more here that you can see there, right? Uh, of what Ellen White describes to us about how wonderful God is and how uh, uh, if you uh, just uh, take a look at uh, uh, what's going on around us, that he, he wants to make us happy people. No two ways about it. So when, when, when you get into a conversation again with somebody about this, you know, maybe you can bring up about that, uh, that amazing little motor in that bacteria cell, right? Because there's no way that evolved. And you can bring up about that crazy cockleburr with the two seeds, right? One one year and one the next, and unless the first seed dies, and then the next one starts growing immediately. I mean, that did not evolve. There's no way. Absolutely no way. Okay. Uh, our closing hymn is, I think, 86. Or was it 80? I can't remember the number. 88. 